Tremendous and a prestigious and a gratifying experience for all of us who have gone through the holy month of Ramadan and done all the ritual. And now is the time, the feast after the fast, it's a celebration. So we have among us a good brother, our Sheikh Faraz Rabani. I first met him at the airport when we were going to Guyana, and subsequently I met him at a kutbah at Matmezard in Guyana, and then he came back and he did a couple of kutbah here, and he was also a guest speaker at, at the last Eid dinner. So he's no stranger to him, I am all, he's a close friend of all of us and a good brother. Our dear Sheikh, you need no more introduction. We are very pleased that you have uh, accepted our invitation to be our guest speaker today. And may Allah reward you. He will address us for as long as he wishes, but not more long than how long he says? Come on, come on. Before us, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, we were blessed to listen to a beautiful recitation of verses of the Quran. And I'll just touch on some of the meanings of these verses because they contain in them many central lessons related to our nurturing of our faith and are remaining connected with our Creator. These verses from Surah Fussilat, which begin from verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by telling us, in the qalu rabbul Allah, thumma staqamu, those who, who declare our Lord is Allah, and then remain upright. What is the consequence? The angels descend down upon them continually. And normally you say tenzilu, right? But tatanazzal, they come down upon them one after the other, continually, declaring to them, that do not fear nor grieve. And do not fear nor grieve. And so the benefit of your faith and your uprightness. Allah SWT says the first benefit is in this life that you will not find fear or grief because you will have certitude and clarity that everything that you see you'll be able to see it in the context of the, the big picture of reality that everything that is happening is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're able to see things as they truly are that's the worldly advantage and part of the worldly advantage is that you have a serenity that there is a hereafter. That whatever is happening in this life, if you respond to it right, in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a promise for you that shall come to pass. What is that promise? وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ And have the glad tidings of paradise. And have the glad tidings of paradise that you were promised. We are your protecting friends in, the, in both your worldly life and the hereafter. And this is a reality, right? We are not merely mortal beings, right? The human being is not merely a lump of flesh surrounding our skeleton of bones. Our reality is far greater than that. The human being, in reality, is the soul that we possess. That is what gives us humanity. Right? That's what gives us humanity, is that soul. And our life around us, right? reality isn't just the fact that there's pillars around here and people. Right? The reality is that this is from Allah's creation and we're only aware of a little of what is around us. You know you have guarding angels with you at all times. There's 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran of the protecting angels that are around us that save us from so many a harm. And even at a worldly level, right? I am super clumsy, right? Just today, I've tripped over, twisted my ankle. I was pouring, I, had, I have a guest over from Australia. So I was pouring tea, but I started thinking about something else. I didn't realize I, I was tilting the pot more and more, and I was no longer looking at it. And the lid fell off and smashed all over the, the kitchen. I'll get to find out about it later because that was just before I had to leave home. So I put a warning, but then I couldn't find the dustpan because my wife keeps everything in place. I don't know where the dustpan was. I was going to clean it. So I put left a little notice that, by the way, you know, there's glass on the ground. Okay? So, but all kinds of disasters almost happen to us in life. If you have kids, you know of this, right? Kids do all kinds of things. How didn't they break their neck and both legs while they're at it? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the manifestation of His mercy, as He tells us in the Quran, there's protecting angels around us that keep us from so much of the harm that could befall us, both the physical harm and spiritual harms. Right? If you think about it, what protects the believer's faith when they grow up in such challenging environments? Right? What, you know, many of you have gone through high school. It's a very challenging environment to be a believer in. What sustains one's faith? When I was in Ghana, I was talking with some of the elders there, and they say, when our forefathers came here, it was very, very difficult. How did people sustain their faith? Because it's not just a human dimension to this life. There's a spiritual reality that from Allah's mercy, that He sent us forces from the unseen that support us and assist us. All of you know, if you've ever been involved in the community, that sometimes you organize things. There's all kinds of strange facilitation. Why? Because Allah sends us reminders, and often we don't take heed, that Allah sends us not only material support, but spiritual support. And these angels are from that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that they tell it, the angels declare to us that we are your guarding friends, your awliya in this life and in the hereafter. And so that even but there's a consequence for it in this life. What's the consequence of the hereafter? وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ And you shall have there, meaning in paradise, all that yourselves desire. Right? And sometimes people ask and they send questions. I work for an online Islamic academy and sometimes people submit questions that will I get to be with my grandparents in paradise? I didn't really get to know them when I was a kid. One of my friends once sent me urgent message three exclamation marks. So I opened it right away. I said, my cat, Tiger, is about to die. And I really need to know right away, will Tiger be in paradise with me? I put it in brackets, assuming I get there. And then he, as if I have a vote in what will happen in the hereafter, I don't. I said, just between you and I, Tiger was a good citizen of this world. He never hurt anything unless he was going to eat it. That is a cat. And this and that, but I'm really traumatized because I grew up with Tiger. So will, will Tiger be in paradise? Right? This is the principle. What is the principle? What Allah SWT tells us in verse 31 of Surah Fussilat. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ right? That in it you will have all, right? absolutely everything that you desire. Anything that you could wish, Allah will grant it for you in the hereafter. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدْدَعُونَ And all that you called for, all those concerns and wishes that you have, all of them will be fulfilled in the hereafter. Not just some, all of them. And not just in the way you wanted them, but Allah will fulfill them for you in the way that will bring you the greatest possible joy. What is this the consequence of? That calm and contentment in this life and that eternal contentment in the hereafter? 
and in the Ladina Kalu Rabbuna Allah, Summa Staqamu. Those who declare our Lord is Allah and then are upright. So when you people always, and I'm not going to talk about what to do after Ramadan, right? Because we hear it all the time. But the reason we struggle post Ramadan is why are we doing this? You're doing this because you're doing those things that you know you're supposed to be doing. Your prayer, your fasting, all the other ways of staying on the straight path. It's not about being on the straight path. It's about getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. About getting to eternal contentment. That's the point of it. These are all means. All of these are means. And Allah reminds us in these verses that there's tremendous consequence both in this life the only means to true, lasting contentment in this life is to be upright on the path of the Prophet ﷺ. And of eternal contentment. Because something to not ever forget is that there's a hereafter. Much of what happens in life makes no sense whatsoever if there's only this life. If you were to think about life and imagine that there's only this worldly life, you should be miserable. You should go mad. It's really troubling. If, that, if this is all there is to it, then we're in trouble. Right? Or you should either feel depressed or just go crazy. Just party till you die. And still you won't be happy. Right? The only means to lasting contentment is to connect with Allah. Right? To, to declare my Lord is Allah and then strive to be upright. And then Allah SWT says, Nuzulan min ghafoorir rahim. Right? This is, Nuzul is both that which comes down, right? but it is also the, the spread. Right? This is the provision, the gift of the all-forgiving and most compassionate. Because right? Allah grants you these favors and these facilitations despite all your shortcomings, all your heedlessness. If you think about how we pray to Allah, if you think about how we fasted, if you think about how we recite the Qur'an, are we deserving of reward for it? No. It's a gift from, from the All-Merciful. Right? And this is how the verses began. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He's calling us to strive for eternal good, He gives us a key right? in the next set of verses, also from Surah Fussilat, here, verses 32 to 36. Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And who is more virtuous in speech than one who calls to God, does righteous deeds, and declares that I am of those who believe, I am of those who submit. Right? Who is better in speech than one who calls to Allah? Who is this referring to? Right? Who is this referring to? One of the things to enrich your faith, connect with deepening your understanding of the Quran. Right? Who is who does this ref, can and I, I want to ask you. Who does this verse refer to? And the verse says, And who is better in speech than one who calls to Allah and does righteous deeds and declare, I am of the believers. Who does this verse refer to? Anyone? Sorry? The believers in general? Any other possibilities? Who could it refer to? Many of the earliest Muslims, I'm referring here from Tafsir al-Qurtubi, one of the most authoritative Tafsir of the Qur'an, right? It refers to the Prophet ﷺ. Who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah? Who is the caller to Allah? Rasulullah ﷺ. Who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah, does righteous deeds and declares that I am of those who submit? And because the... What is the real, who, who is the messenger? He is the one who called to Allah. He is the one 
who is the model of righteous conduct. You want to see the most beautiful way of worshipping Allah? It's the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa You want to know how to call to Allah? It's Him. You want to know righteousness in your worship or in your dealing with creation? It's the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa You want someone who is steadfast on the truth, who declares, I am of those who submit, I am of the believers. It's the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the position of Imam Ibn Sirin and the Suddi and Ibn Ziyad and Al Hassan of the early Muslims, right, from the earliest of the Salaf. And Al Hassan used to say, when he recited this verse, he used to stop. And he used to say, Hada Rasulullah, Hada Habibullah. Right? That this verse, when it says, Who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah and does righteous deeds and declares, I am of the believers? He used to say, He used to stop and marvel. This is the Messenger of Allah. This is the beloved of Allah. Right? And this is a point that is manifest throughout the Quran. Every virtue that Allah praises in the Quran, who possesses it perfectly? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And then he'd continue. Right? Al Hassan would continue. Hada Rasulullah, this, this is the Messenger of Allah. Hada Habibullah, this is the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hada Waliullah, this is the, the close friend of Allah. Hada Safwatullah, this is the most chosen of Allah. Of Allah, Hada Khiratullah. This is the best of Allah's creation. Hada Wallahi Ahabu Ahl Al Ard In Allah. This by Allah is the most beloved of all creation to Allah. Right? And this is a point that you should never lose. Right? And this is not just some, some scholar said it. This this what the earliest Muslims used to say. Right? That who the who is best in speech. And of course, it has a general meaning too, that it refers to any one of the believers who fulfills these three criteria. They call to Allah. Right? Three distinguishing qualities of a true believer. They call to Allah. But how do you call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You call to Allah not by giving da'wah pamphlets. You know, we're not a pamphleteering religion alone. And that could be one part of it. You call to Allah through your conduct then your character, then thirdly, through your words. Right? In that order. The first is your own conduct. How do you conduct yourselves? Because if you conducted yourselves like the Messenger وسلم, conducted himself, right? people would want to be like you. Right? And I've seen this. Right? I, was, I was in San Francisco and we were seeing off one of the distinguished scholars of our times, Habib Omar bin Hafiz, who came to IMO last year, 2011. And he was just standing there. He wasn't giving a speech, he was actually checking in. And at least half a dozen people of other faiths came up to him. Actually, there's these two Mexican young ladies. They wanted to give him a hug. It was kind of awkward, right? Because Muslim sheikhs don't hug unrelated women. So it's like, said, said, to tell him to pray for us. Why? What attracted them to him is just the way he was. He was standing there smiling and you, you, know, you could tell that this is a man of God. They didn't have to say, oh, he's a this, he's a scholar, he's a saint, or he's this. It's people could tell there's something special about this man. There's something that we want to be like that person. And that's how we should be in, in life. That the way you conduct yourself in your work the way you walk down the street, if we follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in our walking alone, people would want to be Muslim. Why? Because how was the walking of the Prophet Sallallahu When he walked down the street, right, it was as if he was walking down a hill. Right? He walked with purpose. The young Sahaba said, we used to struggle to keep up with him. Yet he used to walk with such grace that it was like a ship sailing through the ocean. They said, well, there's so much grace. He walked with resolve. He used to walk fast and with resolve, with so much calm and concern for those around him that no one would hesitate to stop him. No one would hesitate to stop him and ask a question or to start a conversation or to walk with him. Because you know, someone's busy and they're walking, like 
Brother Omar is walking to the office and he's busy because the phone's ringing. You wouldn't interrupt him because someone's busy. But the Muslim was busy, but he was also so calm that you you'd feel no hesitation to interrupt him. Okay. He, he used to always strive to be the one who initiated greetings with others, even with young children. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was always smiling. He was always full of concerns. He had the weight of all of calling all creation to God. Yet, he was always cheerful and positive. If we walk like that, people will be like, wow, I want to be like those people, right? And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah, does righteous deeds, and declares, I'm of the believers, declares not by their words. It's not like we go around saying, we're Muslims. No, it's your actions, right? Your actions, your conduct. The way you deal with you, your character, you're able to ability to restrain yourself when upset. Someone was racist with you. You don't snap back at them. You respond with that prophetic beauty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us here that be like that man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who called to Allah and did righteous deeds and declared I'm of the believers. And the ulama said this declaration is the declaration of conduct and character and then your words. Because if you just say it with the words, without the conduct and character, it'll be empty. It'll be empty and it won't benefit. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out a, one of the highest virtues in our religion. And this is directly related to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa because what is it that distinguished? What made Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Habibullah, what made him the, the beloved of Allah, what made him the best of creation, what made him the most incredible human being to ever walk on this earth. Right? It's the tr not just his excellence of character, his character is described in the Quran as being tremendous. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are upon Tremendousness of character. Why? One of the one of the distinguishing traits is mentioned here. وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ A righteous deed and an ill deed are not the same. A righteous deed and an ill deed are not the same. So when you act, which one do you choose? Both in your action and your response, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. Respond in the way that is better. Ahsan means better, means more virtuous, means more beautiful. Respond in the way that is better. And you'll find unexpectedly that the person between whom and you was enmity will become as though a dear friend. And this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? He was attacked and oppressed and wronged and ill-treated and insulted but he responded with nothing except beauty and virtue he never defended himself he was praying right in front of the Kaaba and some of the disbelievers from Quraysh came and threw animal entrails on his back when he was in sajda what did he do he just continued praying but then his his daughter Sayyidina Fatima came and she took them took the entrails off, and she went and defended her father. He would never have defended himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He never responded to the worst of conduct towards him with anything except the highest and most beautiful and most virtuous standard of conduct. And that's what made him the beloved of Allah. That's what makes him the best of creation. That's what makes him the absolute example. And if we want to be people who have some share of truly following the beloved of Allah, of tru truly striving to be of those beloved to Allah, strive to bring this quality. And Allah SWT calls us to the highest of virtues. And you can say, I can't be like that. But Allah is merciful. He gives us the keys to attain them. You want to be of those beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bring this quality into your life. Respond to the wrong of others with nothing but the good, with restraint, with calm, 
And this, of course, doesn't mean be like a doormat. Someone comes, slaps you on one cheek, say, okay, slap me on the other two, and here's my gut, kick me there. Right? That's not what it means. It means that you respond in a way that is good, in a way that is dignified, in a way that is beautiful, in a way that will be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a way that is going to be pleasing to Allah. This is why Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi, one of the greatest Imams of Islam, was asked, why was the character of the Prophet ﷺ tremendous? He said, his character was tremendous because he had no concern except his Lord. In what he did, what was his concern? What's pleasing to Allah? And that's where you find Rasulullah ﷺ. But then in responding to the actions of others, his concern was, well, he insulted me, and she was mean to me, and she was rude, and he, he didn't give me the respect, and they didn't do this. None of this mattered. What mattered is, what response will be more, most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he is the embodiment of beautiful response, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nothing that you face of any kind of difficulty or wrong or oppression or prejudice compares at all with what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faced. And he responded to all of them with beauty. And we should strive to bring that beautiful conduct and more importantly that beautiful response into our lives, to bring that into our relations with our parents, to bring that into our relationships with our spouses, to bring that in how we are with our children, to bring that into our friendships, to bring that into our family. Be the one who, your uncle was rude to you. He says, I'm, I'm 38 now, you can't speak to me like that. That's your responding with ego, right? Respond with good. Who doesn't mean that, yes uncle, Give me more. Slap me around. Wrong me. No. Means that even if you have to defend yourself, you don't defend yourself selfishly. Right? You protect your right, but you do it in a right way. How? Learn the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He taught us how to do that. And if you do that, what's the consequence? Not only will you earn the pleasure of Allah, but it's of worldly benefit. Allah SWT promises. You'll find unexpectedly the person between whom and you was enmity will become as though a dear friend. So you, you have non-Muslim family members. And they're, they don't like you now becoming more religious. So they say some things. But if you respond in a good way, what will happen? Either immediately or long term, they will they won't be able to avoid loving you. And an example of that came up yesterday. I told you guys I mess up a lot. So my cousin was getting engaged. So I went to the engagement. And I have an, an immediate relative who looked quite upset at me. So I asked my sister, why does she look so upset? So she's upset at all of us. My sister thought that she's just upset at everyone because you know, she's Polish. And, you know, white folk sometimes imagine that Muslims living in Canada would learn to, to do things on time. It's hard. And we're genetically programmed differently, right? So, the wedding time was announced 6 o'clock. My aunt and my uncle, they were there, 5.55. Right? Ready to wait so that when the people came at 6, we'll be there. Right? Of course, no one was there until close to seven. And I knew that or I, because I had I have a guest over, so I was there seven thirty. I thought she was upset that why are you late? And my, my Polish aunt, she tells it like it is. She could be Guyanese too, in that sense, right? You know, you know Guyanese people, you know, they're frank, they'll tell you. If they're upset, they'll tell you. What's with that? But if you're fair to them, they'll be fair back to you, right? So I thought she was just upset that why are you so late? So I said, Chat, I told her, Alexandra Chachi, why are you why are you so upset? Like, this, do you think I'm upset about being late? I'll tell you why I'm upset about. Okay? And it's a bit of a scene because all these people, this is relaxing, it's an engagement, and she's standing and she's gesticulating. And so I said, come outside, I'll tell you. So I went outside. I said, I'm upset because it was Eve and none of you called us. 
because we thought they were out of town. But my sister had called a week before to invite them to eat thing, and they weren't in town. But they changed their plans. They decided not to travel. But they didn't tell us. So none of us, we were three siblings, none of us called my uncle and aunt. And they weren't invited. Right? Now in that kind of situation, you can respond with ego. Right? You can say, well, like you didn't tell us and this, you know, and you give negativity, she's already negative, what's going to happen? It's going to blow up. Right? And it could become a real rift in the family. Alhamdulillah, I was in a good mood. I said, Chashi, I'm really sorry. I messed up. Please forgive me. And I told her, look, you believe in grace. And, uh, sorry, you believe in divine providence. And let's, let's look at it in a good way. This, this is a good reminder that you know, we should be, you know, we should communicate a lot more as a family. And this and that. And you know, I'm very, very sorry. And you know, please forgive me. I want to apologize to my uncle. I told my sister to go and apologize. Although, if you're being like very rigid about it, they told us they're not in town. So why would we call them on Eid when they're not home anyway? And when they changed their plan, they didn't call us. Right? And you could say, it's Eid, you could have called us too. Or you could have called my parents. Right? But you don't respond with ego. You respond, you ask yourself the question, Respond in the way that is best. What is the way that is best? There's three ways to look at it. One is, what response will be most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Number two, what response will be of the greatest good that will have the most beneficial consequences. The third way of looking at it is what response is closest to the response of the Prophet ﷺ. And all three are one. Because the response most pleasing to Allah is the response that is of the greatest good. The response that is of greatest good is the response of the Prophet ﷺ. So the, the lesson to take from these verses is that in your responding to the challenges around you, how do you respond? Don't respond according to how you feel. Doesn't matter. Don't respond according to your ego. Even worse. Rather, ask yourself, what response will be most pleasing to Allah? How do you know what response is pleasing to Allah? Ask yourself, what response will promote good for me, for others, for the situation? How can I know that? لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples to be followed. So always look towards that light. Always. Right? And this is really important in our family relationship. Don't respond to the mean words of your husband with your ego. Even practically, this, in this life, you do that, you respond negative, he'll go more negative. And then he responds more negative, what are you going to do? Give up? No, you're going to become really ugly. But if you respond with grace, you respond beautifully, you will find nothing but good in that relationship. Not just for your husband or your wife, for you yourself. And for you yourself, right? But most importantly, this is what's pleasing to Allah, and this is what will bring you contentment in your life. Is it easy? No, it's not. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, none will be granted this except those who remain patient. Right? No one will be given this except someone who is patient. What is being patient is to hold yourself to what is pleasing to Allah. It's tough. You're upset. Like, yeah, I got to my, my cousin's wedding. I was actually kind of scared because I got there late and I left early. And my first cousin... Right? And already my aunt was kind of upset because some random thing, Allah had been trying to work on making her happy. So I went to compliment my, my aunt. I said, you know, if your husband wasn't standing behind you, we'd think that you're the one getting married. You look so, so nice today. And, this, and she was really, you know, what, what, what her I am? They're all like our cousins and we're just having a good time. This person was miserable. I like, and she's upset at me, like, because I'm the oldest child in the family, so like, like, what's going on? But you could give an egotistical response. You give a good response, she was so happy. I went to my uncle, apologized, but he saw that I was really nice to his wife. He was like, 
He actually became emotional. So if you only he'd call you, you just see us there. I said, I'm sorry. He said, it's okay for us. And like, it was very simple, right? And avoids a problem. Even if you look at it purely dunya-wise, who needs problems? Right? But more important than that, this is a means of earning the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what you should ask yourself. Make your responses according to what's pleasing to Allah. It requires patience. They say patience is like a strange fruit. On the outside, it's bitter. But if you bite into it, there's nothing so sweet. Right? That's like, you know, so it's only the first bite that is bitter. You have to hold yourself back. It's like, ah. Oh. But after that, there's nothing in it but good. Okay? No one will grant it this except those who are patient. And no one will be given this except someone who has a great gift from Allah. Illa duhawwin azim. Who has a great favor from Allah. This is a tremendous gift. Right? And the, the, the ulama say this gift, Allah is giving it to you. Because he's shown you the way of the Prophet He's given you the tools to do this. Right? So this is something that we should learn in our relationships. That if you want to be of those beloved to Allah, learn the prophetic response. Respond only with the good. Pause. Consider what response will be pleasing to Allah. And initially you might need to force it out of yourself. And you'll find nothing but good in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who, who gain this prophetic response to be of those who seek the pleasure of Allah not only in the easy choices of what we choose to do, but in the difficult choices of how we choose to respond to the actions of others. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira. And one of the, the ways to do this, one of my teachers used to say, fake it till you make it. Right? Fake it till you make it. You don't feel calm. You don't feel kind. You don't feel particularly patient. So I advise my younger brother, who's, you know, 12 years younger than me, like, whenever you're upset, message me, but do the right thing. Right? So he'll get upset at my mom about something, because you know, he still live, lives with my parents, I live next door. So he'll he message me, mom, Ammi is annoying me, but, but I'm still smiling. <laughs> right? So, so you don't have to, you just learn how to control that negative emotion, and it'll save you from so much harm in this life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who internalize that example and who find nothing but the good in this life and the next. And may Allah grant us ease, success, and facilitation. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa sallama tasliman kathira. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, our Sheikh, Sheikh Rabani. May Allah reward you for sharing all this knowledge with us. Guess what happened? So may, um, seriously, and we'd like to thank you very much. May Allah reward you for sharing your knowledge with us and being a friend to IMO. I know every time we call on you, according to Brother Omar, and Brother Amir, you're always there to rescue us. And you're always supporting us. And inshallah, we look forward to your continued support. Uh, may Allah bless you and give you good health and strength and enrich you in knowledge and wisdom so you can continue to impart it to us who are hungry for knowledge, inshallah.